Well, good morning and welcome to Benbrook United Methodist Church. My name is Ben. I'm a pastor at Acting United Methodist Church out in Granbury. Uh, I actually grew up at this church and Pastor Don is on vacation this week. And so he has invited me to come and to be with you for worship this morning. I want to let you know that however you're joining us for worship, whether it's on Sunday, whether it's later in the week, whenever it is, that we have one expectation for you today. And that expectation is that through music, through preaching, through everything that happens, that you're going to be ushered into the presence of the living God. And so this morning, as we gather together, as we worship, as we sing, as we virtually lean on each other, I want to take this time to pray with you. I want to ask that you pray for me, that as I preach and as I teach and as we share together today, that we would all meet God. So would you join me in praying to God? Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made. And God, we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. God, we choose to rejoice in the fact that you have known this day, that you've known each and every one of us, that God, the good that comes today, that you are there, the bad, you are there, that God, no matter what happens today, that there is nothing that can separate us from your great love through Christ Jesus. So God, this morning we pray that, that as we are gathered together, God, as we might feel a little tired of distance, and God, as we feel tired of being separated, that God, you would fill us with your strength, that God, you would fill us with your love and your peace and your presence, that God, you would help us to see where you are active in our lives, to trust you, and God, to love you more. God, we pray this morning that you be with each and every one of the people that are in the hospital this morning, with each of those who have COVID. God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon them. God, give them your healing. Keep their doctors and their nurses safe. And God, help them to be instruments of your healing. Lord, for our first responders, we pray the same. God, keep them safe. God, for all of those who are in pain this morning. God, help them to know your spirit and your presence. Help them to know that your love for them is over all and through all and in all. And that, God, there is nothing that they can do to separate themselves from your great love. So, God, be with us as we worship. We're expecting you, Lord. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as I said earlier, my name is Ben, and I am so glad to be here with you this morning. I'm filling in for Pastor Don while he is on vacation this week, and so I want to invite you to pray for him, to just let him know when he comes back that you were praying for him and for his family, that they have a great time together this week. You know, I grew up in Bimbrook, and I actually grew up in this church, and I can't tell you how much it means for me to be invited to come back and to get to preach this morning, and this morning as I was thinking about this church, and as I was thinking about what I would say to you, I, I started thinking about what this church meant to me when I was a little kid, and what it meant to my family. You see, I grew up in this church, and uh, I, as I guess about two years old, I was about two years old, when my brother, my mother, and I started coming here. Uh, Terry Grant has a, has a great picture of the three of us standing in the narthex on our first Sunday, or somewhere around there. We came here for a long time, and when I was about 11, my mother passed away from colon cancer. And I remember this church wrapped me in support, wrapped me and my brother in support after she died. For a long time after that, I remember we would come here, we'd walk to church, we'd ride our bikes to church, not really out of any super religious significance, just that's what you did on Sunday. And I remember my grandfather used to say them little Hebner boys would ride their bikes to church. But of course, he sort of slurred his words, and so it came out as them little heathen boys were riding their bikes to church. And as I was thinking about all these things this week, I couldn't help but think about how this church has made me, me. And how this church has also made you, you. So what makes you, you, or or me, me? 
Because, you know, there's, there's my clothes, of course. There's, you know, the fact that I like country music or there's the fact what I like to eat. There's what you like to eat. There's, you know, the way that you decorate things, the way that you think about things, the political party you have. All these different things make you who you are. Hopefully, your faith in Jesus fits in there somewhere. But as we're thinking about, you know, what makes you, you, what makes me, me, and, and what makes us the body of Jesus Christ together, you know, that may be a question we've had to struggle with over the past couple of months. Because with COVID, I know each and every one of us has had to realize that church isn't a building. Church isn't just being in, in one place together. Church is who we are even when we can't be together. And so this morning, I want to talk about what makes us us what draws us together even when we can't be together are you ready to dive in let's pray oh lord may the words of my mouth god in the meditations of all of our hearts may these things be holy pleasing and acceptable in your sight lord our rock in our Redeemer. Amen. So this morning, the scripture comes from the letter to the Ephesians in the second chapter. And it's only verses 8 and 10, so, or 8 through 10. So listen to this, the word of God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I love history, and I love sort of comparing myself with the people that I find in Scripture, and, and probably more often than not, I like to think that I'm the good guy. Maybe that's not always the case. But I want to tell you a little bit of the similarities that you and I have with the people of Ephesus that Paul is writing to. You see, the Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people who are living in a society where most people do not know the one true God. And if you didn't know it, you and I live in a society where we are probably in the minority. Well, not probably, we are in the minority. Most people do not know God. And so like the people of Ephesus, we not only have to understand who we are, and we not only have to understand who each other are, we have to understand who we are as a group, the church. Now the people of Ephesus have just sort of been newly minted into this church, and they've got to figure out who they are and who they are together. And also like them, we have another challenge that we face, and that challenge is that when we look at the world around us, there is the temptation to follow other gods. There's a temptation to follow other idols. The people of Ephesus were the exact same way. And you know, the people of Ephesus, when they followed idols, when they followed other gods, the people of Israel, when they did, it wasn't always a bad thing. You know, we read scripture sometimes and we think every idol is just terrible. We think every person who follows an idol is terrible. Well, I want you to think about it this way. In the Old Testament, what do we read? We read about Asherah poles and fertility gods and gods of the harvest. Well, if you think about it, there's an awful lot of temptation to follow a fertility god if you can't get pregnant. There's an awful lot of temptation to follow the god of the harvest when your family's on the edge of starvation. And when you hear that the couple down the street went and paid a couple of dollars to make a sacrifice to an idol, all of a sudden, I don't know about you, but I have a little bit more sympathy for the people in Ephesus, the people in Israel. But Paul's also calling them to remind them that they have left this former life behind. Paul's writing to remind them who they are. I want to go back to verse 1 through 3 and read you these words. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects, some verses say children, of wrath. 
Now, I know that for some of you, you're like the people of Ephesus, and there is this marked difference that at one time in your life, you did not know Christ, your life looked one way, there was a turning point, and now you do, and it looks completely different. And I celebrate that you know that difference. And some of you don't have that. Maybe you've been a Christian so long you can't remember, or maybe you were grown up in the faith like I was in this church, and and that moment's not really solid for you. And so you're not really quite sure what Paul is saying here. Well, I want to tell you this. Think with you this morning about a sin in your life that you struggle with. Maybe a sin you used to struggle with, but you don't anymore, and how the Holy Spirit has convicted you of that sin. Well, that's kind of similar to the problems that the Ephesians face, is that they had this life at one point, and now they don't. And so the Apostle Paul reminds them of who they were, where they were, and where they are now. But you see, there's also a difference between us and the people of Ephesus. Because these people didn't have a church in the the physical sense. They didn't have the buildings and, and the stuff that comes along with being a Christian in America. In fact, they didn't have this. They didn't have a a Bible as we would know it. They had the Jewish scriptures. And so the Apostle Paul is trying to take pains to help them understand this is who you are. This is to whom you belong. And he does so in verses 4 through 7. So listen to these words. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us. In Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice something really, really important with me. If we went back to verse 3, what you would see is that verse 3 ends with the people of Ephesus, and and I'm going to argue you and me, being deserving of wrath, being children of wrath. Who we are, how we live, the mistakes we make, means that each of us is deserving honestly of God's wrath. Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory to God. And if you're honest today, then you will know this to be true for yourself. That you by yourself have struggles. That you by yourself sin. That you by yourself try and try and try and eventually you come to the end of your own strength and you need something outside of you. And the good news today is that that is who Jesus Christ is. Jesus is that strength that exists outside of you. And verses 4 and on prove this, that in the face of human brokenness, in the face of sin, in the face of our just messed up and, and wacky lives, that God loves us. Now, I'll tell you, I attend Asbury Theological Seminary. I, I am in my second year as a seminary student, and, and I have read so many books it's not even funny, and I, I know I have even more to read and more to learn. But I'll tell you, one of the things that I struggle with sometimes is really truly understanding how God could love us. Especially when I look at my own life and I see my own sin and I see my own struggle and I see my own pain and heartache, I struggle. I know this. And maybe you don't have that struggle, but I know somebody today does. And on the days that I really struggle with this, One of the best things that you and I can do is we can go to verse 4 and see what I call the greatest but in all of Christianity. See, verse 4 says this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. There's another way to say this, and it's simply this, but God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, God makes us alive. Now that's good news today. That's good news in a world that says that Christianity is one religion of many. Take it, leave it, it doesn't really matter. That's good news for people who are suffering with addiction and with heartbreak and with pain and with disease. That's good news for each and every person on this planet. But God 
who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, makes us alive. But notice, again with me, that that's not where it ends. Because you see, now we get to learn what it means to live in to response of God's amazing grace. I want you to think with me about the people of Israel in the Exodus story. What happens? The people of of Egypt, excuse me, people of Israel are living in Egypt. They're slaves, and God takes them out of Egypt, and really it doesn't take them too long. And then what do they do? They go and they park at Sinai, Mount Sinai, where God dwells. And they go and they sit there at the foot of God's holy mountain, and God says, look, I have given you my grace. I have given you my mercy. I am making you my covenant people. Now what do you do in response? You become my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. By your example, you let other people know who I am. You see, in response to God's amazing grace in our lives, we have to do one of the dirtiest words that starts with an S. Submission. Submit. We have to know that even though we're not comfortable with that word, even though it's a word that that is really different in our society, it's important in the Christian faith. It's a word that conjures up all kinds of responses in our lives, and it's a word that so many people are uncomfortable with because there's a lot of different ways to look at it. You know, there are going to be some people who, when I say the word submission, will immediately jump to submission being a one-way street from a woman to her husband. That's it. And you know what actually they're going to do is they're going to take this letter to the Ephesians. They're going to go to to chapter 5, verse 22, and they're going to use that as a text that proves their point. They're going to say, wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, now I'm not really going to go into this long, but you need to know what we did just did was we pulled a text from its context. And when you do that, you've just created a pretext for whatever it is that you wanted to say. Now, I'm not going to lie. I stole that from somebody. I won't even lie. But I want you to look at the larger context. Because you know what? Yes, wives are told to be obedient to their husbands. But when you look at the larger context, so are husbands told to be obedient to their wives. The passage before it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then the rest of this whole passage goes into how this should be lived out. And actually, if you look at it, husbands you're called to submit to your wife, and there's so much more about that than there is about wives submitting to their husbands. But I'm probably on a soapbox, so I'll stop there. But that's one way of looking at submission. What's the other way? The other way is this, is that submission is an excuse to sort of check out at the door. You know, I I studied religion at Texas Wesleyan, and that's what my undergraduate is in. And I learned that Submission is very different in Christianity than it is in other religions. Now, before I say anything else, I want you to know that I'm going to talk about Islam. And Islam is a beautiful, beautiful religion. And it is a shame that so many people take these really beautiful tenets and distort it into all this craziness. Now, do I agree with everything in Islam? No. I don't think it gets you all the way across the bridge. But I can appreciate what beauty there is in it. And one of the things that I disagree with Islam about is their understanding of submission. Because you see, in Islam, for somebody to believe in submission, which is what Islam means, it means that everything that happens in their life is the will of God. In fact, if you were to go and you were to get a raise and you were to be able to buy a new house from that raise and you were to be able to get a new car from that raise, well, praise God, that is the will of God You are to go, and you are to accept it, submit to it, and then move on. But equally, if you were to go and you were to take that new car, and you were to drink, and then you were to drive and kill someone, that is the will of God. Accept it, submit to it, and move on. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally don't believe that the choices that I make that adversely affect other people are ever the will of God. We understand submission differently. 
But as many weird ways as we understand submission, I want to tell you that I want to talk about the good things that there are about submission because there's a danger in staying only and talking about what submission isn't. Because submission actually can be really good. So I want to tell you three things that I think you need to know about submission this morning. The first is this, that submission is a reminder that you are not in control. You see, submission is a response to what God has already done for you and in you. And submission is telling God, hey, you know what? I might not understand everything, but I trust you and want to learn more about you. Second thing is this, that submission in the right context is a great thing. Now take it all, take all the religion out of it for a moment. Take Christianity out of it for a moment. Think about submission when it comes to dieting. I think we've all heard the joke by now that COVID-19 really stands for the 19 pounds you gained while you were on quarantine. And you know, over the past six weeks, I have been submitting to a diet to try to lose some of that weight and lose a little bit more. And over the past six weeks, because I've submitted to the rules and the regulations of my diet, well, I've lost about 18 pounds. And that's wonderful, but I'll tell you that if I don't submit to the rules and regulations of a diet, well, what happens? Well, there are adverse effects. Things that I don't want to happen, happen. I might gain weight or I might just stay plateaued. You see, submission in the right context is a good thing. Think about this, where it says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In the right context, submission is everything. And the third thing is this, that submission is a lifestyle. You see, submission is not something that you can do on Sunday mornings and then forget about it for the rest of the week. Submission is not something that you can think about for an hour and then expect to change the rest of your life because of that one hour. Submission is a constant battle and is a constant choice to trust God and to die to yourself as Christ Jesus once died for you. You see, submission, at the end of the day, really isn't a dirty word. Because submission, at the end of the day, is not about you and me. Submission is about not what we, or excuse me, it's not about what we can do. Because remember what Scripture says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not of the results of works, so that no one may boast. Submission is all about what God has done for you and in you, and now but what God wants to do through you. But you know, if you were to look at me this morning and say, well, Ben, okay, that sounds interesting. Maybe I haven't submitted to God in a long time. What does that need to look like in my life? Well, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. For you as an individual, I don't know what submission needs to look like for you. I know what it needs to look like for me. But you know, I can't tell you I know where it needs to start for you. And where it needs to start for you is at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Because as this service ends this morning, as we go to the next thing today, you have a choice to make. You see, worship can be just me or Pastor Don or, or Pastor whoever talking for 20 or 30 minutes and then it's over. And it's probably mostly forgettable. I'll be honest, I know probably most of what I say is forgettable. But you know what? Worship can be more than that. Worship can be more than that because God has, has made a way this morning. Worship can be more than that because now it is your choice to continue in worship once this video stops, to practice submission. And maybe for you this morning, that means kneeling wherever you are at the altar of God. Now, I know for you, it's not going to look like this. But maybe this morning as you're sitting on your couch or as you're sitting on your back porch or maybe as you're laying in bed, 
You can go and you can kneel by your bed. Kneel by your couch. Kneel at your kitchen table. And say, God, here I am. How can I submit to you? Because let me tell you, submission is not a dirty word. Submission is all about the response that we have to the God who loves us, who sent his son to save us. And this is us. If you want to know who we are as the people of God, we are people that have been called together to be the body of Jesus Christ, not because of what we have done, not because of what we can do, but because of foremost what God has done for us and in us. And now is ready to do through us. So this morning you get to respond in the most different of ways by submission. Maybe a scripture says you get to choose you this day whom you will serve. Will it be the Lord? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people everywhere said, Amen. We're so glad that you've joined us in worship this morning, and we hope, we pray, we expect that this morning through preaching and through singing and through sharing the elements together, that you will have experienced the presence of the living God, because every Sunday in worship, that is our expectation. I want to thank you personally for allowing me to come and to be part of your worship service this morning. I know that Pastor Don will be back next week with you, and I am so glad to get to come home uh, and get to get to spend this time with you. So as we leave today, I do want to remind you that the work of the church continues. And so if you can, we want to invite you to look at the giving options that are in the description of this video to learn more about what giving means. Uh, you can go and you can look at those. And you can also, I know, pa talk with Pastor Don when he gets back. He'd love to tell you because we all know that even though the world has stopped, the work of the church does not. So if you can give, we'd love for you to give this morning. And now would you go with these words of benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people everywhere said, Amen.